Yes, anchor kids, you're dismissed. And if you need sermon notes, those are also in the back there uh, for if you would like that. Uh, we have a special treat this evening. You're not hearing me preach. That's the special treat, right? Um, we have uh, our, a special guest here, uh, Chris Wiley. Um, he is the pastor of the newly minted Anchor Bible Church West or Oklahoma or however, whatever we want to try to def define them as. Um, uh, this church, uh, Anchor Bible Church in Oklahoma, has just started. They are about a month old. Uh, so the Lord has planted them. Jesus decided that another Anchor Bible Church was necessary in His grand redemption plan. And so he has planted one there with uh, Chris leading them. And uh, uh, just a few things about Chris that I had to write his son about to find out about. Uh, he is, uh, was born in what I would name as Nacogdoches, but that is not the way you say it. That's in Louisiana. The way you actually pronounce it apparently is Nacogdoches. Is that right? Do you guys all know that already? You guys, okay. Well, see, I'm not from the South, so. Um, he is married to Haley, who is from Gravit, so local, basically. Uh, they have five kids, which all but one are here. Okay, we'll have to talk to Isaiah later. There's no reason he shouldn't be here. Okay. Um, he is a graduate from the Master's Seminary, so that's one of the one of the connections we have. He's been serving in some form of ministry, whether it's youth or music or as a as the teaching pastor of the churches he's been in for twenty plus almost thirty years. Um, so the Lord has used him. Uh, some of the guys here know him because of uh, the Iron Man Summit men's conference that happens in Owasso every year. He has preached there, and we've and we those of us who have been under his teaching have been blessed. So that's part of the reason to have him here. Plus, I wanted you to get to know him. A uh, couple things. Apparently, he likes fishing, working outside in the yard. Uh, he plays the trumpet. He likes music theory. To most people, it's just theory. They don't know anything about music theory. Uh, but he also likes calisthenics. That's what your, bro your son said, so I, that's what I got. Okay? So uh, he's going to open up the Word to us tonight. Uh, in Ephesians chapter 4, so if you want to get your Bibles for that, um, and I'll have Chris go ahead and come on up and open the Word for us. Thank you. Did I do this right? Did I unmute? Okay, good. <clears throat> Well, thanks for uh, having us over. It's a blessing. Yeah, we've uh, actually uh, named the church Anchor Bible Church and um, uh, N-E-O-K, Northeast Oklahoma. Since you were in Northwest Arkansas, we decided Northeast Oklahoma would be right next door. So, uh, anyhow. How are y'all doing tonight? Y'all awake? Okay. Didn't eat supper already, did you? Good. All right. You won't fall asleep, maybe. Uh. <clears throat> well, I would. Uh, I appreciate the uh, opportunity to come over and to to preach God's word. Uh, my wife and I have been married for 27 years. It'll be 28 this uh, December. I remember. Um, and uh, there's our first grandbaby on the second row right there, Wyola. Uh, we're uh, pretty excited about her, and she didn't recognize me, I don't think, because I'm in a, a tie and a coat, so she's not... Uh, is this on, too? Okay, yeah. And uh, we're expecting our second grandbaby, yes, Isaiah, and we call his wife AP. Her name is Allie Page, but they're down in Houston seeing her family. You know, it's, it's one of those things, no. No, that's a blessing. She's, uh, they're expecting, and uh, I think it's January that they'll, uh, they're going to have a boy, and so we'll have one of each, so <clears throat> it's a blessing. Well, uh, I have glasses up here just in case, because I can't see sometimes. Um, yeah, there it is. 
Well, if you would, if you haven't already, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 25 and following. Now, we're going to work our way up to that. Um, Paul is writing to this church at Ephesus. He has a love for this church, and he wants to continue in his instruction on how these citizens, these citizens of the new kingdom, are to walk together in love, in thought, in word, and in deed. These verses that we're about to look at revolve around this theme of love or walking in love, which illustrates the new man, life in true righteousness and holiness of the truth. You've probably read through uh, Ephesians 4 several times in your life, and maybe recently. Um, I'll just remind you of what verse 1 says, Paul, therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, says this, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. As uh, a reminder, or maybe you, uh, you probably know the structure, there's a structure to all uh, biblical books, or all books usually, um, if there's not a structure and it's just blah. If I wrote a book, it would just be blah. I, I don't know the structure of books but, um, because I'm not a writer. But uh, Paul writes his epistles with uh, mainly in this order. He writes doctrine and then duty. Doctrine and then duty. This is what the Ephesians, the, the epistle to the Ephesians is written like. You have the first three chapters are doctrine, and then the last three chapters are duty. And so he gives us the doctrine or the principle in chapters one through three, and then the duty or the practice in chapters four through six. So he writes to the church, the Ephesian church, and by way of divine revelation and lasting truth, he writes to us today. So this is a message for us. Now, I want you to note something. This message isn't primarily to individuals, but it's to a church, and it's to the church. Sure, these truths that are contained within the letter are to be applied to uh, individually as each one of us put these things on, but the main thrust is to the church, to the body of Christ, because we are members of one another. So the worthy walk has to do with honoring the Lord by living together as a community of believers in love. We are to walk and to be about walking in humility. Now the word walk has to do with our behavior, our way of life. So we are to be walking in humility, walking in gentleness, walking in patience, walking in enduring love, walking in unity. And these are all part of uh, the instruction that's given to those in Ephesus, walking together in receiving instruction from our pastor, growing up together to maturity, submitting to the head of the church, Christ Jesus our Lord, walking not as unbelievers in their practices of self-centeredness, of self being self-absorbed or being self-established and having and living self-reliant lives, but walking as believers, practicing Christ-centeredness, being Christ-absorbed, uh, being Christ-established, and living Christ-reliant lives. So Paul, he's given general instructions in the first part of chapter 4, and now he seems ready to get down to the nitty-gritty right here in verse 25, through the end of the book. He's presented the truth concerning our lost condition and the truth concerning our saved condition, principles that have lasting effects. As a lost person, you and I were dead in our trespasses and sins. We were, in the word, lost. Um, we were caught up in the world system. We were dominated by sin and Satan. We were a slave of sin, separate from Christ. We had no peace. We had no hope. We were without God in the world. 
We walked in the futility of our minds, and this is all in Ephesians, uh, that led to a darkened understanding of God, that led to hardness of heart, that led to a calloused heart, a calloused living, that led to mindless practices, all the while being under the wrath of God. Now you go tell your lost friend that, right? How to win friends and influence people. You go tell them, you know, this is your condition right now. We don't want to hear that. But that is the true uh, description of us as lost people. We're lost. We're totally lost. But now, Paul says, as a saved person, as one who's been regenerated by God and uh, given and granted uh, the gifts of, of, of salvation, the whole of salvation, the gift of repentance and faith to be placed in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ, as a saved person, we're different. We're recreated in Christ. We're a slave not of sin, but of Christ. We're created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. We've been made alive together with Christ. We who were dead are now alive. We're raised with Him and seated with Him in the heavenly places that already, but not yet. We're brought near by the blood of Christ. We're in a new family. Uh, this church what, started almost three years ago. Yeah. This is a, a new family that we have, right? The new family is not just here. It's, uh, it's over in uh, Anchor Bible West and Anchor Bible North and other faithful churches that are all throughout the country and throughout the world. We're in a new family. It's God's family. A new household. We, we have the Holy Spirit living within us. We're sensitive to the things of God, especially the truth and the leading of the Holy Spirit of truth. We're sensitive to the remaining sin in our lives. We don't want to sin. We have a desire to please the Lord. We have a desire to do and to find what is pleasing to the Lord and live in obedience to Him. So genuine justifying faith in the finished work of Christ always produces fruit of sanctification and good works out of a deep sense of thankfulness. When you start your prayers, when you begin your prayer time, you often go to thankfulness very quick, don't you? Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for my salvation. Thank you, Lord, for, for uh, saving me. Thank you, Lord, for this. Thank you, Lord, for that. We thank Him, and we should. We should spend time in thankfulness to the Lord. And it is out of that deep sense of thankfulness that the life that we live in Christ produces that sanctification, the fruit of sanctification. So Paul has given general principles. And he says in the previous verses uh, to lay aside the old man and put on the new man. But what does that mean? What does it mean when he says in, uh, in verses um, 22... He says, then in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit, and you put, that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. What does that mean? Well, he explains this to us in, starting in verse 25. He explains what it means to put off and to put on. So we want to look at verses 25 and following and see, begin to see <clears throat> and be changed and be molded more to the image of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. So let me read this text, chapter 4, verse 25. Therefore, laying aside falsehood, speak truth, each one of you, with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and do not give the devil an opportunity. He who steals must steal no longer, but rather he must labor, performing with his own hands what is good so that he will have something to share with one who has need. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. 
do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love, just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. Since you are now in a new living relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, since you are a new creation in him, Since you have laid aside the old self and you have put on the new self, and since Jesus paid the price for your redemption, for salvation, for justification, for conversion, for the forgiveness of your sins, for eternal life, and since you have been transferred from the kingdom of darkness, of that that kingdom of chaos, of disunity, you've been transferred from there to the kingdom of light, that is, of peace and of unity. Since you have come under the Lordship of Christ in your life, and since you have been placed in His body, the church, of which this is a manifestation of, then let's get specific about that which is becoming of the new man, of a Christian. What are we to be about doing? Now, the concern here is that the church truly represents the realities of the Godhead, that is, peace and unity. Now, Paul writes with a, a certain uh, a pattern here. And in this pattern, you see a negative, then you see a positive, and then you see a reason or a motive. So you have a negative to throw off, you have a positive to put on, and then you have a reason. So you throw off the old coat of unrighteousness, you put on the new coat of righteousness and holiness of the truth, and then there is the motive. So there's the negative command, the positive command, and then the motive. You don't do this because that's not consistent with being in Christ. You do this, and here's why. The reason is it is consistent with Christ. This is why you do what he instructs to do. Now, the order is changed only in verses 26 and 27. And you have the positive command first, you have the negative command second, and then you have the reason. So let's look, first of all, at verse 25. You have what's called pure truth here, pure truth. You have a negative here. Therefore, laying aside falsehood. This word for uh, laying aside is... uh, uh, apotithami, that's a good word, isn't it? Apotithami. Um, it is to throw off. All of you know Greek here, right? You've, you've already taught that. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know Greek. That's why I had trouble saying it. But anyway, um, this is to, to lay aside. It's to, to throw off. The general use of this was back in verse 22. He says that you lay aside the old self. That's the general use of it. Here, this is particular. It is to lay aside a particular sin. It's to lay aside falsehood. Now, falsehood is translated from the word pseudos, which is the lie. You are to lay aside the lie uh, as of against the truth. In um, Romans 1.25, it tells us that we were once part of the lie. And that is Satan. But now you are in the truth. That is, you are in Christ. The lie is opposed to the truth. And we know, as John wrote, and um, Jesus said in John 8, 44, that Satan is the father of lies. Now, what does lying include? Uh, Sometimes we say, well, you know, I just said a little this or a little that. But what does lying include? You've heard the fish stories, right? <laughs> that one? Yeah. How, how big was your catch today? Ah, oh, caught a big one. It was 
<laughs> caught one in our pond, and we got a little close-up to it, you know. It was this big. It was literally this big. And, uh, but if you get a close-up, it looks really big. But no. No, exaggeration, that's a lie. That's stretching the truth. Looking on someone else's paper while taking a test. That's cheating. Um, writing down false information on important documents. That's lying. Making foolish promises. Oh, I'll do that. Uh, someone says, hey, would you pray for me? Sure, I'll pray for you. Then you don't pray. And they say, well, they come to you and say, well, did you, did you pray for me? Um, <laughs> tell the truth. No, I didn't. I forgot. Um, excuse making. Flattery. Uh, being manipulative. Getting, to get what you want. Giving ear to falsities. Allowing ourselves to buy into Satan's game. Now, should Christians have any part in lying? No. No. He says, throw that off. That's what we are to do. Throw it off. Throw it aside. What's the best way to kill the lie? Tell the truth. Right? All right? And when do you stop being a liar? When you stop telling lies? Or is it when you start telling the truth? It's when you start telling the truth. When what's coming off of your tongue is truth-telling, that's the practice of your life, you're no longer a liar. You're a truth-teller. It's interesting to note that Paul deals with the tongue or the mouth several times here. He talks about lying in verse 29, which we'll talk about in just a few minutes. Unwholesome words, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, uh, but only good words. Uh, 5 and verse 4, uh, he says he talks about filthy talk, silly talk, coarse jesting. In verse 6 of chapter 5, empty words. Verse 12, don't even speak of the vile, unfruitful deeds of darkness. In chapter 6, verses 18 through 20, Paul is concerned that we pray, and he asks for prayer, that he might have utterance to speak the gospel with boldness as he ought to. So even the great apostle Paul asked the church at Ephesus to pray for him so, so that in the opening of his mouth, the words, the gospel would come out, that he would speak the truth in love. So we are to speak the truth, each one of you, with his neighbor. So God is truth. Christ is truth. The Holy Spirit is truth. He is the, the spirit of truth. So God's word is truth. We are saved by the truth. We live in the truth. So we are to speak the truth. When does the newness of Christianity get old? It doesn't. Does it? The longer you're saved, the more precious it is. The more precious it is and the more real it is and the newness of it comes uh, even brighter and, and more vivid on our minds and our hearts. We're new in Christ. What has God's way always been about? He is the God of truth. What has God always desired of His people? To walk in truth. To live in truth truthfulness. So we're to throw off falsehood. We're to put on truth speaking. Why? Because we are members of one another. We're members of one another. So we're to be about speaking the truth. And as verse 15 says <clears throat> of chapter 4, we are to speak the truth in love. We're to be about speaking the truth in love. <clears throat> Is it right for, uh, you know, we, we've, we've, uh, all of us say, well, I told the truth. I mean, it hurt, but I, I told the truth. Well, sometimes the truth does hurt, but we don't try to hurt with the truth, do we? We speak it in love. We speak it in love. It, it needs to be enveloped in love. It needs to be dripping with love. Our speech needs to be. So there's pure, pure speech. There's pure uh, truth is what that is. And then the next... <clears throat> Pure anger. Pure anger. Uh, this word comes from orgidzo, which means to be angry. Uh, he says 
in verse 26, be angry. Here is a, um, a command to be angry. Now, that's kind of dangerous, isn't it, uh, for a lot of us because uh, our anger usually gets selfish. And when it's selfish anger, it gets into sinful anger. Selfishness is sinfulness. So, uh, but he says here to be angry over what? Have this righteous anger over sin. Whose sin? My sin. My sin. Some have taken it to refer to the purity of the church in church discipline. But Paul says, he says here, do not sin in your anger. Now Paul quotes from the Psalms, Psalm 4 and verse 4, which in context has David writing about the unjustness unjust accusations and evil that is going on around him. <clears throat> and he says in verse 3 of that psalm, How long will you love what is worthless and aim at deception? Deception there is pseudos. Pseudos. It's that, uh, that the lie. So he says here, be angry and yet do not sin. We are to be angry. We are to have righteous indignation at evil, at sin, at anything that maligns God's name or person or is against His will. But we aren't to be angry at that which is against us. We aren't to be angry at that which is against us. But oftentimes that's when we get angry, isn't it? When someone does something against us. We go, how, how could that person do that to me? <clears throat> I'm mad at him or I'm mad at her because uh, I, I have this selfish pride that, that I think I'm, uh, I'm a little above what that person thinks I am. And, you know, I'm thinking more highly of, of, of myself than I ought to. And, um, and so it becomes a selfish anger. Jesus was righteously angry with the Pharisees. Jesus was righteously angry with the money changers and, and that which was going on in the temple. And he tossed over those tables and, and coins went everywhere and, and uh, he rebuked them in righteous anger. Why? Because they were misusing the temple, the house of prayer. MacArthur states this, Jesus was always angered when the father was maligned or when others were mistreated, but he was never selfishly angry at what was done to him. He says that is the measure of righteous anger. Now just think about Jesus in his trials. Just think about the false accusations that were made toward him. Just think about all those who were hired. They went out to the marketplace and they brought them in and men who would lie, who would tell lies against Jesus. At the plucking out of his beard, at the, the false testimonies, at the, the hatred that was, that was hurled at Jesus with people's mouths and, and all of those things. And he never got angry at all of that. The measure of righteous anger is this. He was always angered when the father was maligned or whether others were mistreated, but not himself. Um, so he says, be angry, yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Don't let it get to bitterness. Don't give the devil a place, right? He says in verse 27, don't give the devil an opportunity. Don't give him a foothold. Don't have this deep-seated, determined, and settled conviction. Now, that's what this, this word can mean. It can mean having a deep-seated, determined, and settled conviction, and can be either good or bad according to the context. Here, Paul says that sometimes we might have righteous anger, but we let it go too far. It can sour. It can become self-righteous. So we deal with it before 
the sun goes down. Why? Because in verse 27, do not give the devil an opportunity. The reason goes with verse 26 as a motivation to deal with anger correctly and not sin so that you don't give the devil a chance to exert his influence. Now this phrase, do not give the devil an opportunity, is parallel to verse 30, which says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Because when we sin in our anger, we grieve the Holy Spirit of God and therefore give the devil an opportunity, a foothold. So he says, don't let anger be used in a wrong way. Don't let it fester and sin and not deal with it. Or at the end of the day, you just might give the devil a place. Now, the overarching reality here is that the devil wants nothing more Listen, the devil wants nothing more than to cause disunity in a community of believers where, they are, where you and I are to be diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. The diabolos, the slanderer, desires that you and I be angry and get bitter at one another. And start slandering fellow members of the body of Christ so that the Spirit of God is grieved. Christ's name is maligned and God is spoken of in harsh terms. Don't let the devil get a foothold. Be imitators of God. Walk in love. Look at what Christ has done for you. Be reminded over and over and over again of the glorious gospel. The glorious gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. We need the gospel every day. We need the gospel every day as believers. And we need to rehearse the gospel every day as we have opportunity to not only live righteous lives in front of other people, but to proclaim the gospel as God gives us opportunity. We need to be bold in that. Pure truth. Pure anger. And then in verse 28... Pure labor. Pure labor. He says, He who steals must steal no longer, but rather he must labor, performing with his own hands what is good, so that he will have something to share with one who has need. Just so you get this, so that is the reason. It's the result. Okay? So here he has, uh, he says, don't steal. Don't be a klepto. That's what the word is that's translated here, klepto. Uh, We have a word, kleptomaniac, right? Kleptomaniac, one who has to steal. Um, He says to throw off this evil and to put on the good to share. So you throw off the evil of stealing and you put on the good of labor so that you can share. So the negative prohibition is, he who steals must steal no longer. Now, what is stealing? You might say to yourself, well, I don't steal. I don't steal. Well, how many of you have gone and uh, you've borrowed a pen and didn't give it back? Okay, I'm the only one here that has. (laughs) I'm the only kleptomaniac here. Um, No, I'm in a bank. They have a thing full of pens, so, yeah, but I still always ask. I say, can I have one? And they say, yeah, sure. That's what they're there for. I said, well, I'm just making sure. I don't want to take it without permission. Um, but, uh, yeah, it, it's something, something like that. What is stealing? It's taking anything that doesn't belong to you without permission. Taking anything that doesn't belong to you without permission. Stealing, then, is selfishness, which is Part of the old man, of which you are to throw off. The positive here is to kapiao, which is to labor, it's to toil, it's to work hard to weariness. To work hard to weariness. In um, in Second Timothy or Second Thessalonians three, in verses ten and eleven. Uh, Paul says, for even when we were with you, we used to give you this order. If anyone is not willing to work, then he is not to eat either. 
For we hear that some among you are leading a, an undisciplined life, doing no work at all, but acting like busybodies. In 1 Timothy 5, 8, he says this, But if anyone does not provide for his own, especially for those of his own household or of his household, he is denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. We are to labor. We are to labor to provide. Labor in what is good. He says he must labor, performing with his, own hand, with his own hands what is good. That is good in quality. Uh, God honoring employment. Not making a quick buck. Uh, not involved in shady stuff. He says you are to labor with your own hands. Be responsible for your own provision. So that you are unselfish. So that you can be unselfish. So that you can have enough to give. You gain so that you can give away. You gain so that you can give away. What is stealing? It's taking something from someone else that's not yours. You don't have permission to take it. Well, what is uh, when you labor, as Paul says here, labor, so, and labor in what is good so that you will have something to share with one who has need. Somebody has a need, you don't go steal it so that you can give it to them. No, you go labor so that you can have, so that you can give. That's the idea. You gain so you can give. Now, why, why is the instruction for the Christian to work hard to have enough for yourself, but also this, so that you may give, especially to one who is in need? Now, what is stealing? It's selfishness, right? What is giving away? It's unselfishness. It's unselfishness. And that's what we're called to. By the way, that's the love that we are to love with. That's the love that we are to speak the truth in. It is unselfish. It's unselfish. It is, that's what we are to do. So we're to work and to work hard so that we can have, so that we can give. It's not so that we can store up our treasures here, but so that we can store up treasure in heaven to give, to give. That's the heart of God, isn't it? He owns everything, and He gives. Uh, by the way, if we're going through a trial, what are we supposed to do? James tells us if we lack wisdom, we're to go to God and ask Him for wisdom, right? And what does He do? Gives. And this is the way He gives, by the way. It's open-handed. He gives, and that's the way we are to give, unselfish, giving, nothing, not expecting anything in return. Hey, you have a need? Let me bless you by giving. You know, God has blessed me. I, I've worked hard, and, and, and here he's blessed me with his job, and, and I have money and, and whatever, or I don't have much, but whatever I have is the Lord's, and I'm going to give it to you. So it doesn't have to do with how much you have. It has to do with sharing with one who has need, all right? So there's pure truth, there's pure anger, there's pure labor, and now look in verses 29 and 30. Pure edifying words. Pure edifying words. He says, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment, so that, with the result, and here's the reason, so that it will give grace to those who hear. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. So the Lordship of Christ covers our speech, the way we talk. What words come out of our mouths? Yes, it covers our talk. It covers our speech. Colossians 3, uh, verse, I mean, chapter 4, verse 6, Paul says this to the church at Colossae, Let your speech always be with grace, as though seasoned with salt, so that you will know how to respond to each person. Now, in this verse, uh, back in verses 29 and 30, Paul brings forward the contrast 
of evil and good like in the previous verse. Um, there's this sapros, this unwholesome, foul language. He says, let no unwholesome word, this foul language. It, and this word refers to fish, fruit, or other products that are spoiled, rotten, or putrid. So it connotes, this word connotes that there is this corrupt, defiling, injurious speech. He says, let no injurious speech come out of your mouth. Let no putrid speech come out of, no rotten speech come out of your mouth. As we are reminded what Jesus said in Matthew 15, 18, but the things that proceed out of the mouth come from the heart and those defile the man. Now, Ephesus, this church that Paul is writing to, is in the middle of a society that is filled with idolatry. Sin is rampant. Conversations are full of foul language. At the feasts, at other gatherings, it's a toxic environment. And that's where these new converts are coming out of. And he says, let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth. They've been transferred from that kingdom into the kingdom of pure speech so that they speak pure, edifying words. And and we have to learn those things, right? We have to learn how to speak in love. And where do we learn that? We renew our mind day by day with the word of God so that we know how to speak to one another in love. So these folks have come from a contaminated environment to a wholesome environment of Christian fellowship. Now, what society do we live in? We live in that kind of society, don't we? Uh, You can go to any job site, and I know some of my boys have worked in commercial construction, and uh, it's it's a foul, foul language that comes out of men's mouths all day long, and they had to endure that for a year. It was crazy. We were praying for them, and um, hopefully they don't use that language. But anyway, uh, they were uh, they they lived in this. We live in this contaminated society, this environment, and we've come out of that into a wholesome environment of Christian fellowship. From an atmosphere of evil talk to an atmosphere of talk that that which is to be characterized as good, good. He says, but it's only such a word as is good. And these good words are to be for the edification according to the need of the moment. Certainly, uh, young Christians have problems with this, but what about more mature Christians? What about more mature Christians? All of our lives, there remains stuff that we picked up, we heard, and we repeated in our younger days phrases and words. We had a friend over from California, and we're riding down the road, and, and um, you know, we have phrases that we've used that I've, that actually I brought into my family that I grew up using, and, um, and, and he, he said, what does that mean? I said, I don't know. That's just something I've used all my life. What does it mean? And so, you know, we have phones that you can look up Google, Google searches, and you find out what words mean. I said, oh, I better not use that word anymore. I better not use that. And so we've changed so that we don't use those things anymore. And, and, and while he was here, we went through several of those phrases that we used. I mean, they just came out, you know, because that's what we used. And, uh, and so we've had to change those things. Those were words that nobody knew the, the meaning of. Because you had to look them up to, to know. But it, it, they had the connotation of that which was evil, uh, negative connotations, and it wasn't good for, and, and for edification. And so we had to change those things. So when you notice those things come out uh, and, and you find out what they are, you need to deal with them. You don't need to keep saying them. You throw them off and you put on righteous words. You repent, you get rid of that saying, you you get rid of those words and those phrases and replace them with sayings and words and phrases that help those around us. Uh, One of the other things that he noticed about our speech was that, you know, you say uh, Sunday, 
But then you say Tuesday and Wednesday and uh, Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday. Sunday is the only day that has a day in it. Everything else is D. And I said, okay, we'll have to change that too. All right. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, yeah. Had a, had a 15-year-old correcting our speech, <laughs> so, or 16, whatever he was. Anyway, it was a good time. <clears throat> so what are we talking about here? What should, be, what should be repulsive to us? What is some unwholesome language? Unwholesome language includes profanity. No Christian should use profanity. And pastors should never use profanity, right? There are pastors that have been rebuked for using profanity in the pulpit. They want to connect with their audience, and so they use profanity. No, that's unwholesome speech. That's putrid. It it smells like rotten fish. Have you ever smelled rotten fish? Yeah, it's nasty. It should never be used of any Christian, especially those who are standing behind the pulpit. Another example of unwholesome language includes crude stories, off-colored, sexually perverted jokes, vulgar stories, stories or jokes with risque innuendos, words or phrases or stories or jokes that lead the mind toward the gutter. James tells us, you would turn over to James chapter 3. James chapter 3, he tells us that we have enough problems with the tongue as it is. In verse 6, he says, the tongue is a fire, right? The very world of iniquity. The tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of our life and is set on fire by hell. For every species of beasts and birds, of reptiles and creatures of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by the human race. But no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil and full of deadly poison. So what's the, what's the hope? How can we do this? How can we not let unwholesome words proceed from our mouth? but only such a word that is good for edification according to the need of the moment. The only hope that we have to control our tongues is to submit them to the Lord, to submit our tongues to the Lord, to pray and depend on His power. Or as Psalm 141 and verse 3 says, we pray and ask the Lord and do it. Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. The only way to clean up that which comes out of our, how, our, our mouths is to throw off the old foul junk that is still in our hearts and replace it with God's Word, the truth, so that our mouths speak that which is good and edifying and gracious. How many of us know too much of the Bible? None of us. No, we need to fill our hearts with God's Word. So that when we speak, we speak bibline. When we bleed, we, be, we bleed bibline. We need the Word of God. Our new life in Christ is to result in the development of pure, edifying words that are good and gracious and pleasing to the Lord. So let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification. That is, words spoken in love, the truth, building up words, helpful words, Profitable words, informative words, inspiring words, corrective words, delightful words, truthful words. And he says, according to the need of the moment, let your speech always be with grace as though seasoned with salt so that you will know how to respond to each person in different situations, fitting words, contributive words, speaking with wisdom, with Thought through words, not just flippant words, but thought through words, conversations, 
or as like Proverbs 25, 11 says, like apples of gold in settings of silver is a word spoken in right circumstances. Or in Proverbs 15 and verse 23, a man has joy in an apt answer, and how delightful is a timely word. Why should we do this? Why should we not let any unwholesome word proceed from our mouth, but only such a word as good as is good for the, the need of the moment? So that, so that it will give grace to those who hear. As the pattern goes, there's the negative throw off, the positive put on, and the reason why. So that it may give grace to those who hear. As John MacArthur stated, the mature Christian not only speaks the truth, but speaks it in love. Raw truth is seldom appropriate and is often destructive. We have been saved in grace and we are kept in grace. Therefore, we are to live and speak in grace. Just as grace supremely characterizes God, it should also characterize His children. So, what is our speech to be like? It's to always be with grace. Always be with grace. When dealing with each other, whether the situation is just good fellowship or, or is a mentor-mentee relationship or, or maybe you're rebuking someone or correcting or confronting sin, our words are to be gracious words that bring strength, that bring fortitude and comfort and support to those in need. Even in a rebuke, even in a confrontation, it's not a, selfish, a selfishness, it is a rebuke out of love for that person is a confrontation of sin. If you're going to someone, someone's in sin, you go to them, you do it in love. Why? For restoration, right? It's not to kick them out. It's not that, so that they can bow before us. It's not for selfish reasons. It's because they've sinned against God and against you, if it's a sin against you. And you don't go for selfish reasons. You go because they have, they have been, they've, they've separated themselves. There's a breach there. A breach with God, a breach with the church, and you want them to be restored. That's lovingly going to them and speaking to them. It's not, hey, do you know what you did to me? And it's all about me. And this, 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 and this, this, and I need you to repent. No, you show them their sins so that they can be convicted by the Holy Spirit and the Word of God of their sins so that they repent. And they're restored in a right relationship to God and a right relationship with God the church. And then there's reconciliation. What a beautiful thing. What a beautiful thing. Some of the most gracious words that come off the believer's lips are the wonderful words, wonderful words of the gospel of grace. God puts people in our paths. He brings people into our midst. And we have the opportunity to come alongside each other and to be gracious in our speech. Now, the overarching motivation for speaking the truth in love, for dealing with anger over sin, for working hard so that you provide and give, and for using our mouths to bring edification to those around us, is seen in verse 30. Verse 30 is also a hinge to verses 31 and 32 so that we understand that all the negative in verse 31 is also grievous to the Holy Spirit. But the positive in verse 32 of being kind and tenderhearted and forgiving is pleasing to Him and help in dil being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Verse 30 says this, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. This is a somewhat of a mysterious verse in the sense that God's ways are not our ways, and yet somehow, as human vessels, we can grieve the Holy Spirit. He is a personal God whose Spirit lives within believers personally. So he says, do not grieve do not grieve. This word is lepeo. It means to grieve, to vex, to irritate, 
to offend, to insult. The Spirit of God not only, not only lives within believers individually, but He dwells in our midst corporately. And so the church must take care not to offend Him with our lips or other offensive actions that might disturb the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. If we grieve the Holy Spirit, it can lead to quenching the Holy Spirit, as seen in, uh, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 19. It says, do not quench the Spirit. In chapter 6 of Ephesians and in verse 16, it says, you may be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows, that is to snuff out or to quench, or to stifle, or, or to suppress. It's a figurative use there. Here he says, do not, do not irritate, or quench, or grieve, or vex, or offend, or insult the Spirit of God. Now this is a powerful, a very powerful motivation for the Christian not to lie. It's a powerful motivation for the Christian not to steal and not to use foul language so that we will not grieve the Holy Spirit. Paul is very concerned for the church that in our dealing with each other, and by the way, we deal with each other on a regular basis, don't we? We should. The church, we should build our lives around the local church we should be involved in each other's lives. We should know where each other lives. We should know uh, if you have a grill and know how to operate it so that we can come over and you can make burgers and we'll grill them for you. It doesn't matter, whatever. But yeah, we ought to know uh, not everything about each other, but a good, a good part. We should be involved with each other. And he's concerned here in our dealing with other people so that we have deal and that we have dealing with on a regular basis, especially those in the church. By bringing the Holy Spirit into the mix, he shows the personhood of the third person of the Trinity. The Holy Spirit is not some impersonal, uh, impersonal being. He's not some wind or power, but a person. He is the comforter. He is the helper. He is the one who convicts. He is the one who regenerates. He is the one who guides. He is the one who glorifies Christ. He is the one who leads Christians into service to God. He is a person. And so we as Christians are said to be able to grieve Him, to vex Him, to irritate Him, to offend Him, to insult Him. And because the Spirit of God resides in us individually and corporately, we must be very concerned that we do not offend Him with our lips or our actions so as not to disrupt the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. We must be concerned that we do not give the devil a place to exert his influence in the church and that we do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Where falsehood, uncontrolled and not dealt with anger, theft, and foul language thrive, the devil runs rampant and disunity is present. But where pure truth, pure anger, pure labor, and pure edifying words thrive, the Holy Spirit is pleased and unity is preserved. It is preserved. The next one we want to look at is pure kindness. Verses 31 and 32. Thirty-one says, "Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you." So Paul continues the theme of preserving the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace among the body of Christ, in particular by rejecting attitudes and actions of the old man that would disrupt or disturb the unity. And then by adopting attitudes and actions that preserve and promote the church's inner harmony and growth in the image of Christ. These verses act as kind of a summary of the changes that have already been mentioned. Look at the arrangement of the words. Um, 
Someone said it like this, the arrangement of these terms is climactic. The catalog moves from a hidden state of the heart to public disgrace caused by words. It goes from the internals, the hidden, to that which is outward. So he starts with, let all, bitterness. Bitterness. This is, this is resentment, irritability. He says, let all bitterness and and wrath, Uh, this is wild rage, this is uncontrolled passion. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger, that is the internal smoldering. This this is the internals, being being resentful and and having some wild, caged-in rage that is smoldering within. It goes from there to the outward. He says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor. This is the outcry of strife. This is the public outburst. This is that out of control outburst that comes out because of that inward toil that's going on, that internal smoldering. Let all Ang- uh, bitterness and wrath and anger and, and clamor and slander. This is blasphemia. This is the, the defamation of others that comes from a bitter heart and every other form of evil. Malice. He says, along with all malice, general evil, the root of vices. He says, let all bitterness, let all wrath, let all anger, let all clamor and slander be put away from me. I thought he just said that we were to be angry. There's a difference here. There's a difference. This is sinful anger. This is that internal smoldering. Let all anger and clamor and slander be put away from you. Throw it off. Along with all other forms of evil. All generally, the root of vices, that malice. Throw it off from you. These only weaken the church. They, des- they destroy relationships in the church. And they destroy the witness of the church. And in a sense, they cause unbelievers to question the validity of salvation in Christ. That He saves and changes a person. I thought you said you were different. But you act just like I do. You do the same things I do. You are bitter, you're, you're full of wrath and anger and clamor and slander, and you have outbursts of anger. I hear you all the time. Your window's up in your house. We hear you. We hear you. They question the validity of salvation in Christ, that He really does save and change us. We are a new creature in Christ. Paul says there must be a difference. There must be a difference. He says, put them all away from you. Throw them all off and put on the graces of the Lord. What are those? Kindness. Kindness. Uh, This word can refer to something that is easy as a synonym of light and not burdensome. Here, the meaning is conveyed as kind clearly because it involves one another. Be kind to me. (laughs) Just be kind to the person in the mirror, right? How many of us have a problem loving ourselves? None of us, right? We all love ourselves. Um, That's not a problem. Here, the meaning is kind, and it involves one another. We're to be kind to one another. Kind to one another. And then he says, Tender-hearted. Tender-hearted. We're to have compassion. We're to have empathy for others' needs. This is that Philippians 2 attitude, isn't it? Right? Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but, but what? We're to look off onto others. We're to be kind and, and compassionate, tender-hearted toward others. Forgiving. Ooh, we're to forgive others? Yeah, we're to forgive us. Forgiving. This is, isn't this a Christ-like characteristic? Isn't this a God-like 
Well, I'll just say this. I heard this from one man. He said, you're never more like the devil than when you are slandering. And you're never more like God than when you are forgiving. You're never more like the devil than when you're slandering. And you're never more like God than when you are forgiving. Be kind to one another. We're, we're members of one another. We've been saved into a new family, a new household, God's household. We're in the body of Christ. The Holy Spirit has placed us into the body. And this is the visible body that we belong to, Anchor Bible Church. And we're to be tender. We're to be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other. Forgiving each other. Uh, you remember that story of in Matthew chapter 18, verses 21 to 35, the story of a man with an unpayable debt that was forgiven by his creditor, the king. The picture of salvation, right? And then he has someone that owes him just a little bit of money, and he says the same thing to him, and, and he says, you, jail. Jail until you pay it back. There's no forgiveness there. I want my hundred dollars. I was forgiven ten million dollars, but I want my hundred, right? What has God forgiven us? The unpayable debt. He has forgiven us the unpayable debt. You and I, a sinner, have been forgiven by God the unpayable debt of unrighteous rebellion against Him. We've been, pay, we've been forgiven a debt we can never pay. There's no amount of work we could ever do, even after salvation, that could notch us up a bit. Why? Because it's all in Christ, right? He paid it all. All of our righteousness is His. His righteousness is ours. Nothing's credited to our account except Christ's righteousness. Yes, we are to, to live. In fact, the Scripture says in Ephesians 2, verse 10, we have, there are righteous works that God prepared beforehand that we would walk in them. So there is the righteous works that we are to do. What are they? Here they are. We're to be kind. We're to be tenderhearted. We're to be forgiving. That's what we are to be. I feel like this is falling off. Sorry. I'm not used to this uh, deal. So be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. Again, MacArthur states it this way, can we who have been forgiven so much not forgive the relatively small things done against us? We, of all people, should always be eager to forgive. In fact, we're to have such a heart of forgiveness that before anything's ever done to us, we're to have that heart of forgiveness. That heart of forgiveness is to be turned on. It's to be activated. Activated. Now, that's hard, isn't it? It's hard. Somebody comes up and slaps you in the face. What'd you do that for? Repent. We're to have a forgiving heart. Isn't that what Jesus exemplified for us? Father, forgive them for they know not what they're doing. They know not what they do. It's hard, though, because we still deal with the sinful, unredeemed flesh that's still attached to us. Pure truth, pure anger, pure labor, pure edifying words, and now pure love. Pure love. Let me... Go to uh, Colossians chapter 3. Let me read for you uh, these verses, and then we'll come back to uh, Ephesians. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 says this, Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, 
is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. For it is because of these things that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. And in them you also once walked when you were living in them. But now you also put them all aside. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices and have put on the new self which is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. A renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and freeman, but Christ is all and in all. So, as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which you indeed to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Pure love. As a basis of putting off the old man and putting on the new man, becoming conformed to the image of Christ, it necessitates being an imitator of God due to the the fact that we are of God's household and have free access to His throne through Christ by His Spirit. And now, since we are in God's beloved Son, there is an affirmation by the Apostle Paul that you and I, who were formerly children of wrath by nature, are now adopted. We are adopted, beloved children, so we are His children. Therefore, we are to be imitators of Him and walk in love. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. Just as God has forgiven you. This is a statement of the the vital, one man said, a vital foundation of all Christian living. The walk of love flows from the love already shown the child of God. 1 John 4, 10 and and verse 19 says this, In this is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. We love because He first loved us. Just as God, or really since God, it forms the strongest motivation for fulfilling the ethical commands that we've been looking at in this passage God has graciously forgiven you in Christ. This forms the basis of the conformity to the image of God. You did not earn forgiveness. He says, but you were forgiven. You and I do not acquire forgiveness by forgiving others, but we forgive Because we were forgiven and we remain in the state of being forgiven. When we forgive, we reflect being conformed to the image of God and exalt His name, which includes His mercy and forgiveness. In other words, we are to reflect that which is already true of us as Christians. We have been forgiven and so we forgive and thus are to be imitators of God in forgiveness 
and other characteristics and actions. Therefore, we are to be imitators of God as beloved children. Imitators. To imitate. It, it comes from the word that means mimic. Someone who copies specific characteristics of another person. In this case, the child of God imitating our Father. The child of God imitating God. Christians are to imitate God by being forgiving. And especially by imitating His love. But how do we know how to imitate Him? We study His Word. We study His actions. We study His heart attitudes. We get to know God, right? We get to know who He is. We study His words. We study His example. Our Heavenly Father is holy, so we are to be holy. Our Heavenly Father is kind, so we are to be kind. He is forgiving, so we are to be forgiving. He is love, so we are to love. This is not a natural ability, but one that is inherently tied to the one who saved us, so it is supernatural. We have our example of the Lord Jesus Christ, who walked in humility, so we are to walk in humility. He walked in holiness, so we are to walk in holiness. He walked in light, so we are to walk in light. He walked in obedience, so we are to walk in obedience. Walking in love is living a life of holiness. Walking in love is living a life of obedience. It is living a life of, as the previous text says in verse 32, living a life of forgiveness. What is to characterize the life of a Christian? It is love, agape love. It is selfless love. It is self-sacrificing love. It is a love that, that gives and doesn't expect to get. The daily life of the Christian is to be characterized by this divine love. So last week, think. Last week, did my life reflect divine love? Did my life reflect agape love? Was this love characterizing my life this last week? Was God glorified by my life of love last week? Was that love on display? Was it on display? Listen, this love sets you apart from the world. It's a love that the world doesn't understand. We're called to be different than the world. We're called to be different than the world. Love is to be so evident in our lives that it is on display. Again, remember, agape love is selfless, self-giving, self-sacrificing, self-sacrificing. And the demonstration of love is in verse 2 of chapter 5, right? Gave himself up for us. Gave himself. This is what Jesus Christ did. He laid down his life willingly. God personified. He is love. Loving your enemies. Praying for those who persecute you. Walking in love involves keeping things in mind. Keeping these things in mind. Love depends on the one who loves, not on the one being loved. Loving when you don't get loved. Loving is giving when you get nothing in return. Love moves us to act for the other person because it benefits them. It benefits them. That's why you work so that you have, so that you share for the one who has need, right? This is the love we're to, be, we're to have for each other. This is the love that you're to have for one another. Love that we are to have for the Lord and His Word and His church. This is husbands. This is the love that you are to have for your wife. Walk in love. Let your behavior be such that your life is characterized by divine love. And remember, this walk and this life in love is supernatural. We love because... God first loved us. So we might think that we don't need to be taught to love, right? But we do. Because we have the inundation of the flesh and its sinful practices, the world and its fake love, Satan and his counterfeit love. We need to learn how to put that which is in our hearts to work, to life. We love because he first loved us. The battle is not with God and his definition of an example of love in Christ, but it is with our own flesh. 
We get distracted. We get sidetracked. We get fleshly. We get focused on ourselves. Our flesh says get, not give. Love says give, not get. The arrangement that God has made is that He has given us a pattern. He sent Christ. Christ has become our example. As Peter put it, He has given us an example for us to follow. Jesus, remember, in the upper room, He told His disciples, He said this, What I have done for you, or to you, I have given you an example to follow. And He says, I give you this new commandment, that you love one another just as I have loved you. That's what Paul picks up here in in verse 2 of chapter 5. He says, walking in love is imitating agape love. Walking in love is part of the new nature in Christ. Walking in love is the nature of a Christian. Walking in love is self-sacrificing. Walking in love is fleeing immorality. Walking in love is is part of the new nature in Christ. It It is the pursuit of a pure life, a life of holiness. Walking in love is one who gives like Jesus gives. Selfless, self giving, self sacrificing. Walking in love means that we're going to put away and put off the lie and speak the truth in love. Walking in love is that we're going to be angry at that which maligns God. Or hurts other people. But not when it comes to us. We don't want to give the devil an opportunity. Walking in love means that we don't steal. But we work, we labor. So that we can have, so that we can give. Walking in love means that that we don't let putrid words, unwholesome words, proceed from our mouth. Come off of our lips. But only words that are good for edification according to the need of the moment, so that it gives grace to those who are listening. Walking in love means that we won't grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Walking in love means that we're going to put this bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and and slander, we're going to put it away from us along with all malice. And then we're going to be kind, tenderhearted. We're going to be about forgiving each other. Just as God in Christ has also forgiven us. That's walking in love. Amen? Amen. I don't know if we stand to pray or do people stand? Hey, let's stand. You've been sitting a while. Father, we thank you for this time together in your word. I pray that um, you would help us to forsake sin and to seek righteousness. All for the glory of your name. Lord, we pray that if there is someone here tonight that doesn't know you, that they would be convicted of their sin by your spirit. That you would regenerate them. Grant them repentance of sin and faith to be placed in the personal work of the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself up for us. A sacrifice, willingly laying down his life, taking upon himself the wrath of God for our sins. And we've been forgiven by you. May someone even tonight repent of their sins and be forgiven and become a worshiper of the one true living God. May we walk in love, Lord, to be pleasing to you, to bring you glory. In Christ's name, amen. Thank you for that, Pastor Chris.